Good afternoon. I'd like to call the work subcommittee on workforce protections to order. Uh, today, we are gathered to examine the racist origins of denying farm workers, domestic workers, and tip workers full protections under the Fair Labor Standards Act, and to chart a path forward, uh, a path towards finally addressing these inequities. The Fair Labor, Labor Standards Act, or FLSA, is one of our nation's most significant labor laws. First passed in 1938, it created the federal minimum wage, set limits on work hours, and banned oppressive child labor. Yet after more than 80 years, the FLSA still includes aspects of our nation's history of slavery and racial discrimination by expressively, expressly denying farm workers, domestic workers, and tip workers the full protections of basic wage and hour protection. Following the abolition of slavery, Black Americans, the majority of whom lived in the South, were concentrated in agricultural and domestic jobs with little to no pay in order to preserve the profitable economy that had been built on the backs of slaves. By the time President Franklin uh, D. Roosevelt proposed what would become the FLSA, he knew that certain lawmakers who held the levers of power in Congress were committed to denying black workers the wage protections that could lead to their economic and social freedom. Roosevelt acquiesced to the demands of these lawmakers by excluding specific occupations that were overrepresented by black workers from labor protections. Thus, to ensure its passage and to allow employers to underpay black Americans, the FLSA excluded agricultural and domestic workers. In other words, by excluding jobs held by black and brown workers from basic worker protections, the FLSA inserted institutional racism into a federal wage and hour law. And these exclusions robbed workers of color of, of economic security over the next three decades. I know this because I've lived it. In fact, my mother and grandmother were domestic workers. They cleaned other people's houses, so I would not have to, so that I could focus on going to school, getting into the education, and securing a future I desired. Unfortunately, I saw firsthand how impossible it was for them to make ends meet and how impossible it was for them to cover basic necessities, let alone, let alone live comfortably. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, Congress took limited steps to expand FLSA protections, responding to the demands of the 1963 March on Washington for jobs and freedom, the attention brought to the issue by the 1965 California Great Strike, and the advocacy work from civil rights groups, women's organizations, and labor unions expanding coverage to industries with high concentrations of black workers, including agriculture, hotels, and restaurants, helped narrow the racial gap, wage gap, and significantly boost the wages for millions of workers. Similarly, the tip minimum wage is also rooted in denying black workers economic security. Post-Civil War, formerly enslaved black workers were denied wages in hospitality jobs and instead worked for tips. And while tip workers were initially excluded entirely from the FL, FLSA, uh, later amendments extending coverage to these workers codified the practice of allowing employers to rely on consumer tips to subsidize wages. And while there's been important progress, some racist FLSA exclusions are still on the books and continue to prevent people of color who remain overrepresented in these jobs from getting the pay they deserve. Today, farm workers still do not have overtime protections. Living domestic workers uh, still don't have overtime protections. And tip workers are still not guaranteed the federal minimum wage. But today's hearing is not just about reviewing the history of the American labor law. It's about recognizing the multi-generational struggle of black workers and workers of color and confronting our country's legacy of racism so that we can forge a more equitable future. And many of my committee colleagues have spearheaded efforts to correct these decades-old uh, inequities, including Representative uh, Harala, Fairness for Farm Workers Act, which would phase out overtime exemptions for agriculture workers, Representative uh, Jay LaPaul's Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, which among other things, would eliminate the overtime exemption for living domestic workers, and Chairman Scott raised the Wage Act, which would gradually phase out the tip minimum wage. We know that several states have, have extended these key protections to workers 
and their economies have continued to thrive. And of course, no one can speak more authoritatively on institutional racism than the people who experience it each day. So I'm grateful that we're joined by three women of color to help guide our discussion. And I want to thank them for being with us. I'd like now to recognize the ranking member, Mr. Keller, uh, for the purpose of making an opening statement. Mr. Keller. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to be with everyone this morning. As the foundation of our nation's wage and hour protections, the Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA, affects nearly every workplace across the country. However, our world looks very different now than it did 83 years ago when the FLSA became law. The nature of work in the United States and by extension, the American workforce has also changed. These changes matter and have very real implications for today's workforce. This fundamental transformation in the workplace has brought about technological advances that are enabling a diverse population to balance professional and personal needs in ways that were unheard of in the 1930s. While these developments are encouraging, unfortunately, there is a rapidly growing disconnect between federal standards and the needs of a vast majority of working Americans in the 21st century. Committee Republicans have long championed necessary updates to labor and employment policies that help American workers and business owners compete in a global economy. We stand ready to work in a bipartisan manner to modernize the FLSA to meet the ever evolving needs of a workforce that increasingly desires flexibility, choice, and mobility. Unfortunately, the misguided proposals before us today fail to address the needs of the modern workforce and will ultimately harm the very individuals my colleagues on the other side of the aisle claim to help. A radical mandated wage policy and one size fits all regulations will lead to fewer employment opportunities, less economic freedom, restricted hours for workers, and more aggressive use of automation, all while threatening our economic recovery from COVID-19. Congress can either consider policies which incentivize job creators to continue employing American workers and create new pathways for innovation and entrepreneurship, or we can double down on out-of-date policies resulting in unemployment. As states continue to relax COVID-19 restrictions and businesses continue to reopen safely, now is the time to consider pro-growth policies that reflect the needs of our modern economy and workforce and create more economic freedom and independence. Unfortunately, today's hearing will not help further productive discussion about how we can foster an environment to create better, higher paying jobs without costly one size fits all government mandates that ignore industry specific needs and the resources available to small business owners. I would like to thank all of our witnesses for joining us today and uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me just uh, go back uh, to uh, uh, something that I should have done from the beginning. Uh, I do want to note that we do have a quorum and I do want to note uh, for the subcommittee that Mr. Rahalia of, of Arizona is permitted to participate in the hearing today uh, with the understanding that his questions will come only after members of the subcommittee uh, on, on workforce protections on both sides. Uh, it, uh, this is a remote hearing. Uh, the microphones will be kept muted as a general rule to avoid unnecessary background noise and witnesses will be responsible for unmuting themselves when they're recognized to speak or when they wish to seek recognition. And I ask the members also to identify themselves before they speak. Uh, members, please keep your cameras on uh, while in the proceedings and um, you will be considered present in the proceeding uh, when, they are vi when you're visible on the camera. Uh, they're, they're, the only exception to this is that you, if you're experiencing difficulty uh, you need to inform the committee staff of the difficulty. And if any member uh, experiences technical difficulties during the hearing, you should stay connected uh, on the platform uh, and um, uh, let, let us know. Uh, should the chair experience technical difficulty or need to step away, uh, Mr. Takano or another majority member is hereby authorized to assume the gavel in uh, the chair's absence. 
Um, this is an entirely remote hearing. Uh, members should also expect to adhere to social distancing and safe health, health guidelines, including the use of masks and hand sanitizers. Uh, while the roll call is not necessary to establish a quorum in official proceedings uh, conducted remotely, uh, the committee has made it a, a practice whenever there's an official proceeding uh, with remote participation for the clerk to call the roll uh, to make it clear who's present. Members should say their names before announcing that they are present. Uh, at this time, I would like for the clerk to call the roll. Chairwoman Adams? Present. Mr. Ticano? Mr. Ticano is present. Mr. Norcross? Present. Ms. Jayapal? Jayapal is present. Ms. Omar? Ms. Stevens? Mr. Jones? Mr. Yarmuth? Yarmuth is present. Chairman Scott? Ranking Member Keller? Present. Ms. Stefanik? Stefanik present. Mrs. Miller Meeks? Mr. Owens? Owens present. Mr. Good? Good present. Mr. Cawthorn? Mrs. Steele? Mrs. Fox. Chairwoman Adams, that concludes the roll call. Thank you very much. And uh, let me also say any members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the clerk electronically in Microsoft Word uh, by 5 p.m. on the 17th of May. I want to now introduce the witnesses. Uh, first of all, Ms. Uh, Rebecca Dixon is Executive Director of the National Employment uh, Law Project. As Executive Director, Ms. Dixon leads uh, uh, NELP's uh, work to build and contribute to a strong workers' rights movement that dismantles structural racism, eliminates economic inequality, and builds worker power. Mr. Paul DeCamp is a member of the firm Ep Epstein, Becker, and Green. In 2006 and 2007, Mr. DeCamp served as the administrator of the U.S. Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division and now frequently represents employers in complex wage and hour class and mass action and mass actions and government investigations. Uh, Ms. Teresa Romero, uh, president of United Farm Workers, the nation's largest farm workers union. Uh, USW's mission is to help protect the rights and interests of farm workers by creating a safe and just food supply. Ms. Romero is the first Latina and the first immigrant woman to become president of a national union in the United States. Uh, Mr. Hay Young, Mr. Hay Young Young, Mr. Hay Young is Senior Policy Director at the National Domestic Workers Alliance. Uh, the NWA works to raise and strengthen industrial industry standards to ensure that domestic workers achieve economic security and opportunity and have protections, respect, and dignity uh, in the workplace. Uh, we appreciate the witnesses for being here today and participating. Look forward to your testimony. But I want to remind the witnesses that we've read your written statements and they will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to committee rule 8D and the committee's practice, each of you is asked to limit your oral presentation to a five minute summary of your written statement. But before you begin your testimony, please remember, unmute your microphone. And during your testimony, uh, staff will be keeping track of time and a timer will sound when time is up. So please be attentive to the time, wrap up when your time is over and remute, re mute your microphone. If any of you experience technical difficulties during your testimony or later in the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform, make sure you're muted and use your phone to immediately call the committee's IP director whose number is provided, was provided to you in advance. 
So we're going to let all the witnesses make their presentations before we move to member questions. When answering a question, please remember to unmute your mic. Uh, the witnesses are aware of their responsibility to provide accurate information to this subcommittee, and therefore we will proceed with their testimony. I'd like to first recognize Ms. Dixon. Ms. Dixon, you have five minutes. Good afternoon, Chair Adams, Ranking Member Keller, and members of the committee. I am deeply appreciative of the opportunity to testify today. I am here today to talk to you about how slavery and the continued racism, exploitation, and subjugation left in the wake of slavery has directed the passage of the original Fair Labor Standards Act and lives on in exclusions that are still in place today. Congress can act to address this historic wrong and make a material difference in the lives of millions of working families um, immediately. At the time of this passage in 1938, the agrarian Southern political economy depended on the exploitation and subordination of black labor. The, the Southern states held the balance of power in Congress and were unified in their opposition to including black people in new laws that guaranteed wages, rights, benefits, or protections. As a result, Congress used sectors of work dominated by black workers and other workers of color, including farm labor, tipped and domestic work as a proxy for race in order to exclude black workers in particular from the FLISA's protections. This exclusion depressed black workers wages affects still present today in persistent generational wage and wealth gaps. The color line of who worked in which jobs known as occupational segregation continues today with nearly nine in 10 current occupations being classified as racially segregated, even after accounting for education. After years of pressure from civil rights and farm worker advocates in 1966, Congress rectified some of the FLISA's racist exclusions, extending some protections to industries heavily populated by black workers, such as agriculture. But these amendments continue to exclude most agricultural workers from vital overtime protections. In 1974, Congress extended FLISA coverage to many domestic workers and private household service, but not live-in domestic workers, casual care workers, or others that were providing companionship services. The remainder of my remarks will focus on the FLISA's sub-minimum wage for tipped workers. The tipped minimum wage is a legacy of slavery. It was a practice that was proliferated in the US after emancipation among restaurants and hospitality industries which hired, quote unquote, newly free black people and used tipping instead of paying them. Years later, when the FLISA was adopted, it excluded workers in most tipped applications from its protections. For tipped workers, the 1966 FLISA amendment expanded minimum wage protections, but allowed employers to pay a lower wage to tipped workers with tips making up the difference. This is a rare improvement in the FLISA that has lost ground over the years as the sub-minimum wage has been frozen at $2.13 since 1991, even as the minimum wage has increased. As a result, approximately 3.1 million workers in a wide array of occupations are subjected to lower base wages for the work they perform, leading to higher poverty rates and precarity for those who work for tips. One of the reasons this, for this is the high rates of labor law violations, such as not topping workers up. Nationwide tip workers rates of labor law violations are extremely high. Nationwide tip workers have a high poverty rate that is nearly twice that of non tipped workers. Eliminating the sub minimum wage advances equity, promotes economic security, as evidenced by analysis from one fair wage states where tipped workers receive the full minimum wage on top of tips. In those states, the poverty rate for tipped workers was 42% lower than national averages and the gender wage gap shrank by one third. As a final matter, let's talk about businesses and the impact of the one fair wage. Evidence from the seven one fair wage states points to businesses not just surviving, but thriving. An analysis covering 2011 to 2019 finds that the restaurant industry was stronger and grew faster in one fair wage states than in states with a lower tipped wage. Congress has the obligation and opportunity to right the wrongs that we are discussing today. Joining together with workers who are organizing and demanding better wages and the end to laws that have exclusion and inequity at their core. Congress should pass the Rage the Ways Act of 2021, the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights, and the Fairness for Farm Workers Act. 
Each of these will put us on the path toward more equitable and just treatment of millions of workers who have been excluded from these protections of the FLISA for far too long. Thank you. Apologies, I believe uh, Chair Adams uh, is currently off the platform. Hold on one second, please. We're working to get this uh, together. Mr. Takano, as the uh, approved chair, you can recognize Mr. DeCamp for five minutes for the, yes, thank the, you. the hearing uh, going on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. DeCamp, uh, we'll now hear from you for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Adams, Ranking Member Keller, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify at this hearing to address the treatment of farm workers, domestic workers, and tipped workers under the Fair Labor Standards Act. My testimony today will focus on the subcommittee's consideration of three bills, H.R. 603, H.R. 1080, and H.R. 3760. I'm here today to express my opposition to these bills. Given the subcommittee's stated interest in examining the origins of those portions of the FLSA relating to agriculture, domestic service, and tipped employment, I have set forth in my written testimony a detailed discussion of the pertinent statutory language, followed by an analysis of these bills. I will focus my remarks today on the policy and legal reasons why I encourage the subcommittee to reject each bill. First, the proposal in HR 603 to more than double the federal minimum wage from $7.25 to $15 an hour will cost people their jobs. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office has repeatedly determined this kind of sharp increase would hurt more people than it would lift out of poverty. Earlier this year, the CBO considered HR 603 it concluded that while the number of individuals in poverty would decline by roughly 900,000, employment would drop by 1.4 million if the federal minimum wage increased to $15 as people either lose their jobs or drop out of the workforce entirely. CBO has noted that the hardships caused by these steep minimum wage increases fall most heavily on young, less educated workers with the resulting loss of earnings concentrated among families within the lowest income quintile. CBO has also pointed out that as the cost of employing low-wage workers rises, employers shift their hiring preferences, opting for employees with more skill or experience or investing in machines to replace workers. While much of the public debate about $15 an hour posits a sole breadwinner struggling to lift a family out of poverty, the reality is that most individuals who earn minimum wage are young and are not supporting families. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, only about 1.5% of all hourly workers in the United States earn at or below minimum wage, and fully 48% of those individuals are under age 25. Seven out of 10 of them are in service industries, mostly in food service, often earning significant tip income. In addition, it is important to keep in mind that although a minimum wage of $15 might not have much effect on employment in certain high wage cities, in many parts of the country, particularly in rural areas and of the South, the economic conditions simply cannot sustain these kinds of wage levels. And it is important to remember that minimum wage workers cluster in industries such as restaurants, hotels, and movie theaters, which have been especially hard hit by COVID-19. The hospitality industry has lost nearly 4 million jobs and more than 100,000 restaurants have closed. Now is not the time to make things even more difficult for these businesses to keep their doors open. If they fail, workers lose jobs. With regard to the proposal to eliminate the tip credit, the key thing to keep in mind is that 97% of tipped workers prefer the current structure of tipping over no tip options. They earn on average $14.32 an hour in total compensation. Indeed, several restaurants that shifted to a no tip approach ended up switching back to tipping after their wait staff quit. Tipped workers are simply better off with the tip credit than without it. Turning to HR 1080, 
It is important to understand the economic consequences of eliminating nearly all of the FLSA's agricultural exemptions. The nature of agricultural work, especially harvesting, requires long hours during a relatively short season, thus rendering the jobs generally unsuited for overtime. Some farmers may try to cut workers' hours, leading to lower earnings per worker, but finding extra farm workers is no easy task, and most farmers would end up seeing a dramatic increase in labor costs, leading to higher food prices for consumers. At the same time, American farmers would be at a distinct competitive disadvantage with respect to non-U.S. agricultural producers. In addition, smaller independent farming operations and family farms would likely suffer the most as they are less able to absorb higher costs than larger, more robustly financed corporate farms. Finally, my opposition to H.R. 3760 today centers mainly on its likely unconstitutionality. The bill intrudes into people's homes and imposes on individuals sweeping legal obligations untethered to legitimate federal interests. It is far from clear that Congress has authority under the Commerce Clause to regulate purely local employment within a private residence, particularly given the current configuration of the Supreme Court. This concludes my prepared remarks. I welcome any questions that members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we'll hear from Ms. Uh, Romero. And again, I want to apologize for my internet, inter internet uh, uh, issue that I had a moment ago. Uh, Ms. Romero? Thank you, uh, Chair Adams, Ranking Member Keller, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Teresa Romero, and I am the President of the United Farm Workers. Today, I'm testifying on behalf of the United Farm Workers and the UFW Foundation. Farm workers work day, work day in and day out to plant and harvest the crops and care for the livestock we all rely on for our food. The COVID pandemic has underscored the critically important work of farm workers. The pandemic also has highlighted the vulnerability of farm workers due to the discriminatory exclusion from key protections other uh, workers enjoy, such as FLSA's overtime pay. The history of agriculture in the United States is a history of racism. During, during the New Deal period, President Roosevelt and his allies compromised with Southern congressmen to exclude work traditionally associated with black workers. By excluding farm workers and domestic workers from FLSA, Congress sought to preserve an economic system that exploited black people. Members of Congress at the time were explicit. They did not believe black people deserved the same wage protections as white people. As stated by Representative Wilcox, and I quote, there is another matter of great importance in the South, and that is the problem of our Negro labor. When we turn over to the Federal Bureau of Board the power to fix wages, it will prescribe the same wage for the Negro that it prescribes for the white men. Now, such a plan might work for some sections of the United States, but those of us who know the true situation know that it is just will not work in the South. You cannot put the Negro and the white man on the same basis and get away with it, end quote. Today, our nation is painfully aware of our entrenched racism and the impact it exerts on people of color. Congress must take one step towards addressing systemic racism by, by ending the discrimination that endures in the FLSA. Farm workers would benefit greatly from overtime pay. One of the purposes in enacting FLSA was to eliminate labor conditions detrimental to the maintenance of the minimum standard of living necessary for health, efficiency, and general well-being of workers. The exclusion of farm workers from the overtime protection flies in the face of that purpose. Farm workers work for low pay and in dangerous condition, conditions, which is exacerbated by long hours. Beyond the increased dangers from the pandemic, agricultural work is among the most dangerous work in the country. Farm workers are disproportionately likely to be harassed, poisoned, injured, or killed on the job. Overtime is needed to help minimize the damaging effect of agricultural work in the body. Trust me, more than 40 hours a week in agriculture is extremely challenging and can lead to long lasting injuries. Overtime pay would also provide additional income for farm workers, many of whom live in poverty. Relief from uh, uh, poverty provides security in other areas. For example, farm workers with great economic security will feel more confident living abusive employers. The United Farm Workers worked with California legislature in 2016 to end the race-based exclusion of farm workers from overtime pay. 
The economics of overtime pay for California's agriculture have had a positive impact. Farm workers are able to get more, more pay and California's agriculture continues to thrive. Recently, the Washington legislature passed a law that faces in overtime pay for agricultural workers after the state Supreme Court found that the exception of dairy workers from overtime pay was unconstitutional. The governor of Washington is expected to sign the bill into law. In conclusion, now is the time to right the wrongs that can no longer be tolerated. We must end the racist exclusion of farm workers from FLSA's overtime protection. It was wrong then and it is wrong now when most farm workers are Latino. I thank Representative Grijalva for his leadership fighting a racist exclusion of uh, farm workers from overtime. We call on Congress to enact Republic Representative Grijalva Fairness for Farm Workers Act. As our member Jorge Maldonado shared upon learning about overtime pay in Washington, winning overtime pay is a victory of equality. It is a, history, a historic moment and I am happy to have been part of it. We cannot progress if we're building on the foundation of injustice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, we'll hear from uh, Ms. Young. You recognize five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Domestic workers in the early part of the 20th century compared to today's workforce have both changed dramatically and remain remarkably similar. In the earlier part of the 20th century, although women increasingly joined the workforce, their job opportunities were limited and black women and immigrant women were virtually shut out of better paying jobs that some white women were able to get. In 1930s and 40s, black women were overwhelmingly represented in domestic service. Today, domestic workers are from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds. To give you a sense of the diversity, when we survey domestic workers in 2012, we interview workers from 71 countries. What has remained the same in the last 80 years is that women are overrepresented in the sector. Today, over 90% of domestic workers are women, while over half are women of color and a third are immigrants. Unlike farm workers, domestic workers were not expressly excluded when the law passed in 1938. On its face, the exclusion appears race and gender neutral. The coverage was based on whether worker engaged in commerce or in the production of goods for commerce. But research shows that while a more expansive interpretation of the Commerce Clause was legally permissible, political consideration dictated to conclude that domestic work did not implicate commerce. Committee debates show that the exclusion of domestic workers along with farm workers mo were motivated by racism, allowing employers in the South to dictate the terms and conditions of black labor and to maintain a racial and social hierarchy. Some legislators opposed the law on the ground that it threatened to equalize wages between black and white workers. Others compared FLISA to anti-lynching legislation. We also see the workings of sexism. Seeing domestic work as women's unpaid household labor, Roosevelt is quoted to saying that the Fair Labor Standard Act is not intended to apply to quote, domestic help. It took a large movement for Congress to extend FLISA coverage to domestic workers in 1974, finding that domestic service affects commerce. While it extended protection to a significant number of domestic workers, it also left many out of its protection. Congress narrowly exempted companions and casual babysitters from the minimum wage and overtime protection, but entirely excluded live-in workers from overtime protection. The Labor Department took the companionship services exemption and defined it overly broad to carve out a whole class of home care workers whose vocation is to provide home-based services to older Americans and people with disabilities and exempted third-party employers like a home care agency from paying their workers minimum wage and overtime. In 2013, the Labor Department issued new regulations to bring the scope of the exemption in line with congressional intent and to reflect the dramatic changes in the home care industry. Now, millions of home care workers are covered under minimum wage and overtime protection and third-party employers are required to pay their workers minimum wage and overtime but live-in workers who are hired by private households remain excluded from overtime protection. This legacy of racial and gender exclusion continues to shape the working lives of domestic workers. 
Their work is devalued, they're underpaid, and largely unprotected in the workplace. In 2018, domestic workers earn just about 16,000 a year, significantly lower than other workers whose average annual income was about 39,000. Wage theft and other workplace violations are pervasive across domestic occupations. They often work long hours and are exposed to potentially harmful cleaning products. Given that the nature of domestic work is intimate, too many workers are subject to sexual assault and harassment, physical and verbal abuse. Domestic workers' ongoing exclusion from other federal workplace laws, such as Title VII, health and safety laws, leave them without protection. This is the reason why this Congress must pass the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights to protect domestic workers across the country. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to um, all of the uh, uh, to all of the uh, all of our guests for their testimony. Uh, under uh, Committee Rule 9A, we're going to now question witnesses under the five-minute rule. I'm going to be recognizing subcommittee members in seniority order again to ensure that members' five-minute rule is adhered to. The staff will be keeping track of the time, and the timer will show a blinking light when your time has expired. So please be attentive to the time, wrap up when your time is over, and uh, re-mute re your microphone. Uh, as chair, I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Dixon, um, uh, there are entire business models that assume or center around excluding farm workers, domestic workers, or tip workers from protections afforded to other workers. So does that mean it's too late to correct these exclusions? And why is it important for business leaders to examine the impact of these business models on workers of color? It's never too late to examine the change in these business models. When something is rooted in white supremacy and exclusion of workers of color, even those unaware of the roots of these exclusions should not continue to profit and benefit from them. But because we know that far too many businesses are built on the benefits they reap from these exclusions, we know that we cannot erase them immediately without doing undue damage to business. This is why, for example, the Rage the Wage Act could calls for gradual elimination of the tip minimum wage rather than an immediate eradication of it. And as we know, that advocates, the advocates for tipped workers are very open to further discussion about how to ensure that we reach one fair wage in a manner that's economically responsible. But what we are not open to is continuing to enshrine a sub-minimum wage for tipped workers and continuing to perpetuate an exclusion that is rooted mm -hmm. in the blatant desire to avoid paying wages to Black workers who were formerly enslaved and that operates in a manner and means that women of color who make up a disproportionate share of tipped workers continue to earn lower wages. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Yun, uh, uh, Ms. Yun. Uh, I came from a uh, long line of domestic workers, my mom and my grandmother, both uh, were domestic workers. The work then was hard, it was undervalued, underpaid, and unfortunately, that still seems to be the case. Uh, domestic workers have been called the invisible workers on the front line of the pandemic. Is this invisibility connected to the history of the FLSA that we're discussing today? Thank you for that question. Very much so. The pandemic has revealed how many workers we have taken for granted their labor devalued, and their contribution to the economy made invisible. It took a pandemic to rec recognize that domestic workers who have been providing care and essential services to our children, aging parents have been helping us to function as a society and making it possible for all of us to work. A care job is a job enabling job. While families sheltered at home last year, many domestic workers continued to go to work facing an impossible choice around how they're going to feed themselves and keep themselves and their families and those they care for safe without necessary protection, protective equipment and easy access to testing. The fact that domestic workers face these impossible choices is because they have been earning poverty wages, living paycheck to paycheck, no access to paid time off. This insecurity is both the legacy of exclusion from FLISA which has had a domino effect of being excluded from other laws and from legislation even introduced in this Congress, like the Healthy Families Act. Okay, thank you. Ms. Romero, um, through my work on the Ag Committee, I've worked to support struggling Black farmers 
We've also faced discrimination in federal policy. Uh, and this committee, it's clear to me that we must uh, also work to provide uh, farm workers who are overwhelmingly Latina with basic uh, protections. How do we balance these goals and how would you respond to the concerns that farmers are struggling right now and that making farm workers eligible for overtime pay would be a, a, a difficult cost for farm, farmers to bear? Thank you, ma'am, for the question. Uh, you know, when I think about those who struggle in agriculture, I think of farm workers and whatever time pay would mean to them. You know, a doctor's visit, um, enough food on, uh, for their family without having to go to uh, food banks. And while agribusiness lobbyists talk about struggling small family farms, the reality is that most farm workers are hired by big companies who like any other private business should provide the workers with the basic FLSA protections. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, now yield my other few minutes. I'm gonna uh, give those back. But I wanna recognize the ranking member for, uh, for the purpose of questioning the witnesses now. It's the ranking member. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. DeCamp, the Workforce Protection Subcommittee is here to help ensure that Congress makes policy decisions based on sound evidence. Our evidence does not support the claim that the one size fits all $15 national minimum wage would benefit economically or geographically diverse parts of our country. Based on your experience working with employers, uh, what complications should Congress anticipate if legislation takes effect that would increase the national minimum wage to $15 an hour uh, and uh, apply that to the same thing for tipped employees uh, that work throughout the United States? I think we'd see significant job losses and that would be especially true for younger and less skilled workers. This would be a significant barrier to entry for people trying to get their foot in the door to become employees, to get jobs in the first place. Uh, and I think that this would also have a severe impact on tipped industries, including restaurants and hospitality uh, that rely on the tip credit as part of the wage structure, given how customers typically pay for services. Uh, this would cause devastating effects, especially in uh, rural and Southern parts of the country where the wage levels are not as high as in certain cities. Uh, and I guess if I just follow up on that, your experience in, in what you've worked, uh, the people you've worked with, whether it's the employers or the employees, um, a lot of the tipped wages are people that might be in college, people that might be, uh, you know, graduating from high school, first jobs. Is, is, is that a fair statement to say? Yes. Where, where people get experience on, on, on work and, uh, and are able to enter the workforce. It, exactly. I mean, most of the folks that are making minimum wage are not people who are uh, adults supporting families who've been in those positions for years. More commonly, you have uh, minimum wage workers are either entry level workers uh, achieving their first job or something early in their employment, uh, or they're individuals who are getting a tipped wage where their total earnings are substantially in excess of the minimum wage. Thank you. I appreciate that for, for clarifying that. Uh, Mr. DeCamp, businesses across the country. Um, especially those in the restaurant industry are re reporting that they are struggling to find workers to fill open jobs as the economy fully reopens from COVID-19 pandemic. If Congress were to pass the Raise the Wage Act, which eliminates the tip credit, that would, uh, what would impact do you believe this radical policy change uh, would have on the ability of restaurants, hotels, and related establishments to recruit and retain individuals who enjoy the doc documented benefits of receiving tips for their services? The current estimates are that about close to 700,000 tipped employees would lose their jobs. Uh, in addition, I think countless restaurants would close. This would be devastating for the workers who need these wages the most. Okay. Uh, also, Mr. DeCamp, farms in the United States face seasonal and weather-based uh, constraints in their annual operations, as well as the challenges that arise when caring for livestock and other animals, all factors that don't follow a regular nine to five office schedule. In light of these realities, can you explain on the impacts uh, that Rep. Uh, Rehalge's uh, proposed changes to the FLSA's farm worker overtime exemptions would have on farming operations and agricultural workers? 
Well, sure. Far farmers would face a choice. They'd either have to reduce hours of, of individual workers and spread the work around, which would reduce the pay of individual workers, or they would have to pay higher labor costs. And if they have to pay higher labor costs, they then have to charge more for the agricultural products that they sell, which then has ripple effects throughout the economy. It increases the cost of food in restaurants and grocery stores, and also puts those farms at a competitive disadvantage with non-US agricultural producers that don't face the same labor costs. So uh, seeing that would result in people uh, earning fewer wages or, or l less wages, and then also would impact maybe people on fixed incomes, retirees, as far as the cost of receipt, uh, being able to purchase food and, and other items. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. DeCamp, as you, as you noted in your testimony, the FLSA is over 80 years old. There is bipartisan agreement that many of the FLSA's provisions and regulations are outdated and overly complex. Do you agree with that view? Uh, yes. I mean, this is a topic that could take uh, a full hearing on, but yes. Okay. I was, I was just going to ask if you could identify elements of the FLSA that should be updated to meet the needs of our 21st century workforce. Clearer standards for who is an employee, possibly having a non-binary employee independent contractor approach, clearer objective standards for who is exempt or not exempt, clearer standards for what contemplates or what constitutes compensable work. All of those would help a lot. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. I want to recognize Mr. Takano of California. Five minutes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. DePaul, um, have you ever worked farm work? Have you ever worked on a farm? Like done I've not worked on a farm. Work? I'm sorry. I've not worked on a farm. When I was at DOL, I did participate in okay, a number right, of Thank you. Thank you for that. I just, I just turned over soil. Uh, in my yard, just a little, a few square footages. It was hard work. Um, how many college students do you know working farm worker jobs in this country, um, like real farm worker jobs? I mean, do you see a large share of, of college students working farm worker jobs, young people? No. Well, it's mostly, it's mostly mature adult people working, backbreaking work on farms. What about, um, what about uh, home care workers? A lot of a lot of teenagers and college students work in those jobs? Nope. Okay. Um, I, you know, can I ask uh, Mrs. Ms. Romero, Ms. Romero, um, can you confirm that the, the, the typical farm worker is, is not a, a teenager uh, or a young person uh, that needs an entry into the workforce? That is correct, sir. And typically, I mean, what, what are the ages of people who work on farms doing the backbreaking work of, of, uh, of, of hoeing, tilling the soil, all, all, you know, all of the stuff that goes in the hot sun. Tell me, tell me about that. I mean, Sir, we just have workers, uh, probably, you know, I can tell you that we have workers that are in their 20s. Uh, we have uh, workers that are, I can tell you one of our members, Rogelio Lona, has been in working in agriculture for 40 years. He's over 70 years old. So we have, uh, um, uh, workers that are probably older than, uh, you know, where you're talking about teenagers or, or early 20s. Yeah, so what, I mean, this, the arguments being put forward by Mr. DePaul is that, is that a, a minimum wage across the country, one fair wage is going to deny a lot of young people uh, entry into uh, jobs. What do you have to say about that? I mean, it's one of the narratives they're using. You know, there is not a lot of young people that are looking to work into agriculture. It's very demanding, very physically demanding. But there is also actually a study that addresses uh, the question of, of uh, the, the cost of our food. The study found that increasing wages uh, to farm workers by about 40% would only increase consumers' uh, household grocery by $25 in the entire year. And that study was done by the agriculture economist Bill Martin and at the Economic Policy Institute. Look, I, I can tell you that the average age of farm workers is 38, about 38, 40. 38, 30 years old, and they're not protected by uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act. They're not protected uh, by the minimum wage, even the federal minimum wage. I, I can't see being 38 years old, let alone 40 years old or 50 years old, working under the hot sun and then finding out that 
I have to work longer than eight hours a day or longer than 40 hours a week and not protected by overtime. Um, what Are there any states that do provide farm workers with overtime protections? As I said, sir, California, uh, the UFW uh, worked with the uh, California legislature in 2016 and farm workers, uh, the overtime pay is being phased in. This year, farm workers earned um, overtime pay after eight and a half hours a day. And next year is gonna be after eight hours a day in California, and I'm sorry, le uh, Washington legislature just has a law that says that uh, it is unconstitutional uh, not to pay uh, workers overtime pay. And it's expected that the governor will sign it. What do you feel about the fact that so many workers across this country who work demanding physical labor aren't protected by, the farm workers are not protected by overtime pay in other states? You know, as I mentioned, sir, it is uh, a very, th these, these protections or exclusion of farm workers were based on racism. Um, as our Jorge, like, like I said, our, our, our Jorge Maldonado in Washington said, if we continue to build on, on these uh, uh, times or, or, the, or the decisions that were made at one time uh, on, on a foundation of injustice, we're not just going to be able to get these workers to get uh, the pay that they deserve. They deserve our time that they, they feed our country. Well, uh, I, I'm just seething with anger at Mr. DeCamp's testimony, which seems to reject any racial motivations for excluding farm workers from the FLSA in 1938, and instead suggests that the nature of farm work led to the farm worker exclusions. I, I just don't know what to say. Madam Chair, I, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to recognize the uh, gentlelady from New York, Ms. Stephanie. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to follow up on Mr. Takano's questions. Clearly, he represents a district that's very different than upstate New York. I represent tens of thousands of small family farms. And in fact, these are multi-generational farms. So college-age students do go home to work at the farm and also run those farms. These farms are fighting to hang on. It is a tragedy that family farms have closed over the past decades. We should be making it stronger for domestic agricultural supply and those multi-generational small family farms to exist, not harder. So Mr. DeCamp, my question is for you. As I mentioned, I do represent tens of thousands of small family farms in upstate New York. And I am very concerned about the implications of mandating the 40 hour work week on farmers and farm workers. As you know, and any farm family knows and any farm worker knows the inherent nature of farming calls for long hours often in very short windows in order to cooperate with the unpredictable weather and the narrow harvest times. New York State has implemented an overtime threshold for agriculture employers, which has forced many small family farms in my district and throughout the state to cut hours for workers and eliminate labor intensive crops. Several fruit and specialty crop producers, for example, have cut down fruit trees in order to spare the expense of growing fruit that they cannot hire someone to pick. So my question, Mr. DeCamp is, what is the overall economic impact to U.S. agriculture if farmers had to pay overtime after 40 hours? And what effect would this have on the ability of American farms to maintain a strong domestic food supply? Well, with the caveat that I'm not an economist and, and, and don't claim to be, uh, from a labor uh, incentive standpoint, uh, I think it's fair to say that employers in this industry would face great pressure to do something about the overtime cost, either by spreading the work around, which is the policy behind the FLSA's 40-hour work week, or by having to pay the higher costs and find a way to, to make do with that, either by raising prices or by having lower profits. Um, I think the reality is it would cause, where possible, farms to employ people for less hours. Uh, I could certainly envision situations where farms will employ people for three days a week, and then those folks would go to a different farm for the other two days a week. The farm workers need the hours, they want the hours. And so I don't think the farmers, the, the farm workers would be working less hours. It would be a question of where they'd be doing it. Um, my next question is related to, and you mentioned this and Mr. Keller did as well, but the fact that we are in a global marketplace when it comes to agricultural products, my district borders Canada, 
And in many ways, we want to make sure that American farms are not at a competitive disadvantage. Given that proximity to the northern border, we're in direct competition with Canadian farmers for market access, especially for fruit and vegetable products. Canada currently has a lower minimum wage than New York State and exempts agriculture from overtime requirements. And as a result, our upstate New York markets are often flooded with Canadian product, putting our New York and American farmers at a severe competitive disadvantage. So my question is, would this 40-hour work week and the increased cost of American American product open our markets to further influx of cheaper foreign products? And what kind of effect would that have for farmers who already compete with those foreign products in our U.S. domestic market? Uh, again, I think that when you raise your cost structure uh, and you're competing with businesses that have a lower cost structure to produce the same good, it puts you at a disadvantage in the market. I think this would create a lot more difficulty for American farmers to sell their products, especially where they are in a market where there is uh, a, an easy supply of lower cost produce. And if that's at the northern border, at the southern border, uh, places where there are um, uh, readily perishable goods coming across the border uh, from a much lower cost structure, uh, it, it creates huge market pressure for the, for the farmers and could well drive them out of business. And then my last question, Mr. DeCamp, is there's a lot of discussion between bigger farms and smaller farms, and uh, this mandate would impact all farms, but it would be specifically hurtful and impact small rural family farms. Can you talk about that, how it would specifically hurt those rural family farms? Well, smaller farms that don't have the same kind of, of um, accumulated savings, that don't have the same kind of, of lifeline, that don't have the same kind of integrated operations that can perhaps uh, function as a loss leader for other businesses within a chain, uh, are unable to weather the storm. They can't deal with uh, short-term or longer-term um, drops in profitability. Uh, they, they, just, they just don't have the resources to do it. Thank you very much. After a year of unprecedented uncertainty for our family farms, we need to be making it easier and more supportive for them to grow domestic products, not harder with these one-size-fits-all mandates. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Norcross, you recognize five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, it's great to have a committee that's absolutely focused on survival. Um, we're hearing testimony on how it, in fact, affects business, and certainly they're part of the equation. But the fact that we are a dozen years, 12 years since the last minimum wage increase, more time than in the history of minimum wage, and that somehow this is a radical move? Are you kidding me? Seven fifty an hour in the wealthiest nation in the world that incrementally and predictably would raise it. Unbelievable, we're still having this conversation. And then we look at the tip worker and I gotta ask, uh, Ms. Dixon, when the change took place for tip workers saying you could combine that $2.13 and make up for it, in tip wages. How are the tip wages reported? How does management estimate or prove that they're actually getting those tip wages? So um, part of the reason why there's so much non-compliance in restaurants is that uh, employers don't actually track the tips and as required by law. So if you don't keep track of the tips, you don't know how to top up. So that's one of the big issues that we see. And you can see how even well-meaning employers can get caught up in that. And certainly the ones who want to do it intentionally um, can do it. Sure. So there's a financial incentive not to collect that information. Correct. Okay. Now, when we go to Europe, so many people tell us, oh, you don't tip workers over there because they're already making that. So the model for the majority of the world is not using tips, is that correct? That's correct. Um, in the US, we uh, came to tipping uh, in the post-emancipation era as a 
you know, a way to treat formerly enslaved people where they just get paid whatever they get paid, whatever you want to give them as opposed to paying them a wage. So when we look at trying to level the playing field, what should have been done long before this and raising the minimum wage, incredibly important. But when those tip workers go to, if this law is passed, to a minimum wage, that means that their competition is paying the same thing, correct? It levels the playing field. It absolutely does. And it gets rid of this unfair advantage that uh, that workers, subminimum tip wage employers have had versus other employers. So the, the idea of competition is that everybody will be paying this. Is there any chance for, particularly in the restaurant industry, that foreign competition is going to bring in food and deliver it to people? You said foreign competition? Yes, yes, foreign competition. In other words, are they coming over from Canada to deliver food because they can do it cheaper? Um, most of what we've seen is that restaurants are local, and right. that's, exactly. that's where My they're... Point is right. There is no foreign competition, so that piece of it out. The McDonald's on this side of the river will pay the same as that side, and they don't receive tips to a restaurant. This levels the playing field, takes that incentive that the employer can do for not counting tips out of the equation. Then you know what? If they want to tip on top of it, they do. Uh, it's time to wake up. I have nothing against the folks on the other side of the aisle. This is a moral obligation to make sure people can live. I know a lot of time is taking care of the billionaires. We got to remember the people who are literally keeping this country running. I yield back. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, I want to recognize Mrs. Miller Meeks of Iowa now. Five minutes, ma'am. Is Ms. Miller Meeks uh, on? Okay. Um, Mr. Owens of uh, Utah. Mr. Owens of Utah. Uh, Mr. Mr. Good of Virginia. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Third time's a charm here. Glad to be with you all. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you to our guest today. Uh, you know, it's sad to see, though, Democrats once again framing every issue in terms of race, seeking to further divide our nation, perpetuate a false narrative, and further portray a victimhood mentality. Democrats also never miss an opportunity to put illegal aliens and foreign workers ahead of Americans. If they truly wanted to protect foreign guest workers, they would support the work of Border Patrol and Customs and Border Protection. I have been to the border and I've heard the reports of physical abuse and danger for those illegally crossing. Those who can't afford to pay smugglers are extorted into carrying drugs and other illicit material. Others are abused as indentured servants to the cartels. If they make it across, many are forced to live the rest of their lives with existential threats to themselves and their families. While Democrats will romanticize illegal immigration, demonize law enforcement, and turn a blind eye to the horrific abuse that people face at the hands of the cartels, my questions are how long will it be until the president, the vice president, visit the border? When will Democrats stop attacking Border Patrol, ICE, and local law enforcement? And if Democrats are truly worried about exploitation of Gelf's workers, will they support mandatory E-Verify? Turning specifically to agriculture concerns and, our, and my questions for our witnesses, I have, as somebody asked earlier of another member on our panel, I have worked on farms. I worked on dairy farms, horse farms, agriculture farms, picking crops, baling hay, and much more. It is very hard work, but there's honor in that work. Uh, I now have the honor of representing Virginia's 5th District that has over 300,000 farm workers. Recent years have been difficult for farmers, thanks in part to China's trade war and the mishandling of COVID-19. But only Democrats could look at a struggling industry and think now is the time for more costly and burdensome regulations, as they believe more government is the answer to everything. So, Mr. DeCamp, can you please comment further on the economic impact for farmers if Democrats force H.R. 1080 upon them, the Fairness for Farm Workers Act? I don't know that I have much to add beyond what I said before, which is that it creates pressure on 
uh, farmers to either reduce hours for workers in order to avoid having to pay an overtime premium, or it forces them to absorb a higher cost structure, which threatens their viability and threatens to increase prices substantially in the market uh, and puts them at a competitive disadvantage with foreign producers. Um, it's, it's tough and for businesses that are barely making it, especially smaller farms, um, it can be the final nail in the coffin. Yeah, don't you think there's a disconnect uh, in the Democrat policy of requiring overtime pay in agriculture to the realities of what farm work is like? I think that farm work, much like many other jobs in the Fair Labor Standards Act for which overtime is not provided, is such that it is not susceptible to the policies of the FLSA. It doesn't make sense, in other words, to apply the overtime premium to this kind of work, much like many other kinds of work that are exempt under the FLSA. Uh, can you point to any examples of similar policies that have been acted in other states that, uh, uh, be, you know, outside of Virginia that uh, have hurt the ag economy? I, I'm not familiar with, with the uh, much state law regulation of, of agriculture. What do you, if producers are forced to grow less labor intensive crops because of this change, uh, that's been proposed. Uh, how do you think the food supply might be negatively impacted? The question would be, would those same food products come from somewhere? And if they came from somewhere else, would that necessarily involve a higher cost to consumers? Uh, and then I'd also be wondering about if the farmers are using less labor intensive crops, um, what are the farm workers doing? Are they going to have jobs to set affect employment for those workers in the industry? If the farmers are saying, we're just not gonna plant those crops. And undoubtedly, that would hurt the wallets of consumers as prices might go up with more scarcity of products because they're not grown, because labor has shifted to more, less labor-intensive uh, products that are grown. You know, again, uh, to, my, to the panelists, uh, to our guests, and to my fellow uh, members of this committee, it's a shame that we think that, that many, the majority here at least, thinks that government's the answer to everything, more government intrusion, more government regulation, instead of letting the... Uh, letting the, the the free economy work, and uh, we want to layer more levels of regulation, Thank intrusion you, upon these farms. Gentlemen's out of time. Uh, I maybe, think I got uh, 10 seconds. Right. <laughs> I yield back. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the gentlelady from Washington, Ms. Jagopal, you have, you have five minutes, ma'am. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I really appreciate this hearing, and I'm always stunned at the um, what feels like a lot of hypocrisy in the in the comments that get made in this committee. Um, the hypocrisy of exploiting labor but not wanting to honor that labor with immigration reform, or the hypocrisy of saying we want mandatory e-verify without immigration reform, when even the farmers have told us that they don't want that because they need the workers. So I hope we can get to a place where we're not denying that overtime premiums should apply to all workers. Why should some workers be asked to uh, work without that overtime? I just don't understand that at all. We're here today to take responsibility for the legacy of the Fair Labor Standards Act, which excluded domestic workers and farm workers from protection. I wanna focus on, uh, on domestic workers. Today, over two and a half million nannies, house cleaners, and care workers do the work of caring and cleaning in homes across this country. Over half of these domestic workers are Black, Hispanic, Asian American, or Pacific Islander. And in 1930, an estimated 79% of domestic workers in the South were Black. So domestic workers have traditionally been people of color. Ms. Dixon, how would you explain this fact and how does it relate to the ongoing exclusion of live-in domestic workers from benefits such as overtime protections under the Fair Labor Standards Act? This, uh, this rule was rooted in racism as we talked about earlier in my testimony and the fact that it uh, moved from one set of women of color to another set of women of color is not a surprise. Um, the, the moment is now to get rid of this there is no reason that we allow this exploitation to continue. Thank you. And Madam Chair, thank you for mentioning my Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. That bill would fix this for domestic workers by extending common workplace rights and protections to domestic workers, including overtime pay, paid sick days, privacy, and other civil rights protections. The bill also extends new workplace rights and benefits that address the unique challenges of domestic work 
requiring written agreements, fair scheduling provisions, a national domestic worker hotline, and a standards board to investigate standards in the industry. And it would create and fund an interagency task force on protecting domestic workers' workplace rights to ensure robust enforcement of the law. These protections are crucial for domestic workers like a woman I'll call Ramona. She is a home care worker and she's a leader with the National Domestic Workers Alliance in my district. She's an immigrant from Honduras who identifies as black. Ramona has faced sexual harassment and assault as a domestic worker in every city she's worked in, but she never reported the incidents because she didn't know where to turn. Ms. Yoon, your testimony indicated that Ramona's experience is common among domestic workers. How do we protect domestic workers from sexual harassment and assault on the job? Yes, the experience of domestic worker you just shared is unfortunately too common. Workers know that they have no recourse, but they're current because they're not currently covered by Title VII and thus not protected from sexual harassment, assault in their workplace. This is the reason why we need to pass the Domestic Worker Bill of Rights to protect individual workers, but also establish standards across the country in these workplaces. Ms. Yoon, Mr. DeCamp seems to deny any racist motivations behind denying domestic workers protections under the FLSA, instead suggesting that a narrow reading of the Commerce Clause at the time was the only reason these workers were excluded is that the case? And is there any legitimate reason to continue excluding domestic workers from the full protections of the FLSA? No, that is not true. My reading of the committee debates, as well as other research on the Roosevelt administration's drafting of the process depicts a different story. While domestic service certainly was not comparable to the agricultural sector in terms of its importance to the Southern economy, the huge concentration of Blacks in the domestic service was unmatched by any other sector in the Southern economy. During the committee debates, Southern legislators compare FLISA to anti-lynching legislation. I think that statement speaks for itself. And in terms of what we should do now, systemic racism and sexism motivated the exclusion in 1938. And then 80 years later, this workforce continues to bear the brunt of that legacy. We have to think about the cost of not protecting these essential workers who help our society to function and make all other work possible. It means that domestic workers are earning poverty wages and cannot support their own children and family when they're working to care for other children. Thank you so much. Uh, I think for Ramona and for so many others like her, we are ready to be the authors of a new story and that begins with passing the Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I Thank yield you. to you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, <laughs> Madam Chair, can you now hear me? I'm sorry, I, I was trying to talk earlier, and, and this is uh, Owens. Yeah, yes, you, yes, we can. Uh, and okay. I'm getting ready to recognize uh, uh, Mr. Owens of Utah. Uh, you have five minutes, sir. Th thank you, Madam Chair, um, and, and thank you for those that are testifying today. Uh, let me just start off by saying I totally agree that uh, 1938, the uh, it was a racist act by the President Roosevelt to put in place what he did, not only there in this area, but also Social Security. It was also a racist act for the Democrats to continue to support the Davis-Bacon Act, which keeps black uh, business owners from starting businesses and hiring black, black, uh, black employees. Uh, this is not about race. Uh, we have small business owners out there, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, every, every culture you can possibly think of, that are right now producing 50 million jobs in the, in the private sector. Um, it is not about race, it's about survival, taking a risk, making a profit, and then hiring people that you want to keep around and make sure they, that they are, they're feeling uh, good in, their, in, their, in that environment. This would devastate uh, the small business owners, no question about it. Let me remind everybody what's already been stated and uh, as a fact, uh, it will, those that most at risk, predominantly my race, would not get a raise with this, they'll get fired, they get a pink slip. It's, it's proven, it's seen, every place has been shown, in, 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 uh, in, in, in Chicago, in, uh, uh, eight years ago, 92% of black young boys were, not un were unemployed. A lot of it was because of the higher minimum wage that nobody wanted to hire them with. The other piece of this is the higher cost will bring a higher cost, of the labor brings a higher cost of food. This impacts blacks, Hispanics, those at risk, citizens on, in uh, on a, on a uh, fixed income. So no, this, this is not something that would work. And, um, and I, I wish that, that, that members across the board that come in, in this position 
we're trying to start a business at some point before we start putting these type of regulations and, and, and dictates on those who are trying to survive in business. So that being said, uh, uh, Mr. DeCamp, uh, can you elaborate on some of the reasons that Congress exempted the agriculture establishment from certain requirements of the FLSA when it was enacted in 1938? And, uh, and what makes these workplaces unique from wages and, and, and the uh, hourly wage perspective? There's a few things about it. First is that the nature of the work tends to be a very short season and tends to involve very long hours during the day when that short season is happening. We're also talking about work that um, many of the workers in that space are migrant uh, and, and so they're moving from place to place. We're also talking about work where oftentimes the people that are doing this work are receiving housing and possibly food subsidy from the employer, certainly housing, sometimes food. And that affects the calculation of what even is the wage. Um, and so that's another issue under the FLSA. Um, I think the main issue with the FLSA and agricultural work is the necessary long hours. The purpose behind, or one of the key purposes behind the 40 hour work week under the FLSA is to encourage spreading of work in a time of high unemployment. So that if you know, you, you're, you're moving work to more workers as opposed to fewer workers. Um, and that makes sense when you, when you want to spread the work around, but when the work requires the long hours, you've got to find the workers to do this. We're already talking about an economy where about half the work, at least according to the written testimony from, from the witnesses today, uh, is being done by workers who are uh, undocumented. This is already a, a workplace it kind of in chaos and a workforce that is kind of in chaos. Uh, and I think it, that's just a recognition of the fact that this work requires long hours, among other things. And it's also very difficult work. I mean, the, the statements that members have made uh, and witnesses have made is absolutely right. It is very demanding work. Okay, thank you so much. Um, for those who, who not truly understand the fact that uh, when a business owner has to pay more for, uh, for the labor, they don't quite understand how that translates to impacting those of us who have to pay for those services. Uh, you stated that the Fairness of Farm Workers Act will likely result in higher food prices for consumers at grocery store and restaurants. Again, this impacts those at risk, like my race, more than anybody else out there. Can you help those who are listening to understand why this would be the case? Sure. If a business is not able to um, spread the work around, so if you're a farm and you have workers and you're not able to hire 50% more workers and instead have to use the same workforce working the same long hours, now you would, under this bill, have to pay them overtime. So if you have to pay premium wages for the longer hours, your labor costs go up. If your labor costs go up, you're either going to be losing money or you have to raise your prices for what you sell in order to not go out of business. If you raise your prices for what you sell, that then has ripple effects throughout the, the chain of distribution so that the business that you sell the product to then has to charge a higher price when it is selling that food in a grocery store, in a restaurant, or wherever it may be. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now you're back my time. Thank you. The gentleman's time is up. Uh, the young lady from Minnesota, Ms. Omar, you are recognized. Five minutes, ma'am. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, the preservation of the tipped minimum wage system has long lasting effects on worsening economic outcomes for workers of color today. It shouldn't be surprising that it is just another system sharing its roots in the le legacy of slavery. In the post-Civil War United States, many Black workers were concentrated in the hospitality industry and designed to preserve socioeconomic subordination. They were denied base wages and instead had to work for tips. This tipping model wasn't changed by the Fair Labor Standard Act, but we have an opportunity to address this historic discrimination through the Raise the uh, Wage Act. My state of Minnesota has already taken the necessary steps to establish a fair wage for all, but it's also one of the only few states that have addressed the tipped, wage, tipped minimum wage largely due to opposition from the restaurant industry. Ms. Dixon, can you respond to some of the concerns over the phase out of the tipped minimum wage hurting profitability and surging labor costs for local restaurants? Absolutely. Tipped, the tip wage has been $2.13 since 1991, and that's unconscionable. 
And we are not talking about phasing it out overnight. We're talking about phasing it out over time. And as I said in my testimony, um, the advocates are open to compromise on that phase out. We know that seven states have already done this, so it's possible um, and it's much better for workers. So we're not advocating for getting rid of TIPS, but we want TIPS plus the minimum wage um, like in those states. Um, and we really don't want employers to continue to get this subsidy for their payroll costs, as you mentioned. And why would you, uh, uh, why, did, why have restaurant workers in Minnesota not lost their tipped income or their lost uh, or their jobs due to this, this change? The amount that employers have to increase their menu price is very small. And so if we're talking about a phased in increase over time, we're talking about very small increases. Um, there was a study in one of the one fair wage areas that looked at an increase in wages of about 25% and the menu price had to go up by a dollar and 10 cents. So it's really overblown um, what folks are saying about increasing menu costs. Really appreciate that overblown uh, is is something that we should we should highlight uh, because a lot of these policies that are being um, pushed by by Republicans is fear based and they're not based in in reality um, because some of us live in some of these states where progress has been made and have not suffered the crazy consequences that the Republicans like to tell the American people that they will suffer. So really do appreciate uh, your input in that. Madam Chair, I would like to yield the rest of my time to Ms. Grijalva. Yes, Ms. Grijalva, you recognize. Thank you, and I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Uh, very quickly, uh, uh, Madam Chair, just thank you uh, and the ranking member for uh, bringing these three pieces of legislation forward. Appreciate it very much, and, and, and the witnesses and, and the hearing have been uh, uh, very, very good, and I appreciate that. Uh, Representative Jail Paul, Chairman Scott, and myself, I think if these bills are essentially corrective actions uh, to address some vestiges of uh, what's already been said by the witness, systemic racism as a standard uh, at, got codified into law in 1938. And uh, this double standard so that some American workers do not uh, receive the equal uh, protections that others do is uh, basically wrong and rooted in that uh, and rooted in that racism. And I, I think that what uh, these three bills do is provide equity and, and to, to these workers and by correcting uh, that mistake in 1938. And so um, I, uh, it's ironic that these now are essential workers and, and uh, they're the ones taking the risk uh, those are the ones we depend on to take the risk for the rest of us, uh, to provide services to the rest of us. And uh, I think it's time that we treated those workers equally. And uh, I appreciate the time, uh, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for the hearing. And I yield back uh, my time back to Ms. Omar. Thank you. The, the, okay, you've got six minutes. Okay, the latest time is up. I'm going to yield to Mr. Cawthorn now uh, of North Carolina. Uh, you have uh, five minutes, sir. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, my questions are going to be directed at Mr. DeCamp. And Mr. DeCamp, thank you for being on. To all my witnesses, uh, really thank you for being on. Uh, you know, I, first I want to touch on this idea of in, imposing the 40 hour work week on farmers. You know, as someone who's worked on a farm in Western North Carolina when I was much younger, I realized that the hours you have to work are very, very long. And it's very difficult for these farmers, especially those who pick specialty crops, to be able to have more workers to spread around because it takes a significant amount of training. Uh, these, these workers have to be trained on how to work the systems, especially if they're in a packing house or if they're in, uh, on picking spe any specialty crops. Uh, can you discuss, there's something I really want to touch on is you know, I believe that after the global pandemic that we've been through, we saw during the beginning of COVID-19 how it, difficult it was to get a lot of the resources that we had offshore manufacturing to other areas. If we start imposing this 40-hour work week and we bankrupt all of our farmers, we will essentially be offshoring all of our food processing and food resources to other countries. And do, not, do we not believe that this would be a, a terrible national security threat, Mr. Kim? 
I, I don't claim any expertise on national security. I, I think generally it would be a bad idea to bankrupt the farming industry, but what effects that might have on national security, I have no idea. I understand. Okay, so, so now let me ask you uh, in regards to Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It prohibits employment discrimination, but this only applies to employers with 15 or more employees. Uh, the Title I of the Americans with Disability Act also only applies to employers with 15 or more employees. The domestic worker bill we're discussing today includes an astonishingly sweeping provision applying Title VII of the Civil Rights Act to any employer with at least one employee, reducing the employee threshold from, a, from 15 employees to one. Uh, Mr. DeCamp, can you discuss, discuss the radical nature of this change and what it would mean for small businesses in the United States with respect to litigation risk and compliance costs? It would be a big change with regard to exposure. I mean, part of the reason why you don't have typically these laws applying to small businesses, at least at the federal level, is A, the Commerce Clause issue. It's at, at that level when the businesses are that small, they're typically very local. But also there's a sense that the compliance costs for small businesses, we don't, you don't, they don't have the kind of sophistication that you typically see with larger businesses. They don't have in-house counsel. They don't have in-house HR staff. They don't necessarily even know what these laws require until they run afoul of them. And the just the transaction costs of defending a, a demand letter from a plaintiff's lawyer uh, could put a small business out of business. Uh, and so there are lots of good reasons why Congress has seen fit not to apply most of these laws to very small businesses. Thank you, Mr. DeCamp. And uh, in closing, you know, I would encourage any of my Democratic colleagues on this committee to please come to my district and visit a lot of the farms in my district. You will see the hours that are re required to work, and it will become evident, abundantly clear to you that if we impose a 40-hour work week on these farms, it will bankrupt our farmers who are absolutely necessary to the survival of our country. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Um, the young lady from Michigan, Ms. Stevens, you recognize five minutes, ma'am. Okay, let me move on to Mr. Yarmouth of uh, Kentucky. You recognize, sir, five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thanks to all the witnesses for being here. I, I have to say, this is my 15th year in uh, the House of Representatives, and I have heard the same arguments raised by Republicans for 15 years as to why we shouldn't raise the minimum wage. It is bizarre to me that for that length of a period of time that, that Republicans continue to raise issues that have no empirical support, uh, yet they continue to say that businesses are gonna go bankrupt, we're gonna lose businesses, we're gonna lose jobs. Uh, when, when that, Really, they have no basis for saying that. It's all speculation. Uh, Mr. DeCamp, I, I, I referenced, uh, you referenced the CBO report that, uh, and said that it said that we would lose uh, 1.4 million jobs if the, the minimum raise, ways were raised to $15. That's not exactly what the report said. It said we could lose 1.4 million jobs. It said we also could lose zero jobs. It also said we could lose more jobs. Uh, and, and that's the problem with these kind of, uh, actually these kind of reports because people seize on numbers that really have, uh, they're, they're, they're speculative as, as well. We have an economy that is very dynamic, that changes very rapidly. Uh, so we don't really know that. I, I, right now in my district, I don't have any farms in my district. I have a handful of farms. I'm a very urban district, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And so I haven't talked to many farmers, but I have talked to a lot of business owners. And right now the business owners say, we don't, we don't, we wouldn't mind paying $14, $15 an hour. We can't find anybody. Uh, we can't find anybody to work. And it seems, so we have, uh, in our district, we have uh, UPS, which is our largest employer, offering $14.25 to start uh, there. We have Walmart and Amazon, who have just uh, distribution facilities right outside my district, paying $15 an hour. Um, I think that's probably the reason that some businesses can't find uh, employees is because they're, uh, they're not paying enough money. They're just not paying enough. 
And you know, I once had a, had a conversation. This was when I was campaigning the first time and, and the minimum wage was 5.5. And we were talking about raising the, the minimum wage. And I asked this, it was a McDonald's franchisee who was fighting it. And I said, let me ask you this. If I came to you and said, I've got the greatest business model in the world, it can't miss, it is a surefire hit. The only, the only condition is that I have to pay my employees nothing. I have to have them work for free. What would you say to me? He said, I think I'd say you're crazy. And I said, in today's world, and this is 15 years ago, in today's world, what's the difference between 5.25 an hour and zero? And I would ask the same question today. What's the difference between 7.25 an hour and zero? And the, also, the thing I would also say is, we st I still have yet to hear a Republican make a counteroffer saying, well, 15 is too much. We've got Democrats saying that. Joe Manchin saying that. He says, I could go to $11. I don't hear Republicans saying that. They just say, we can't afford to raise the minimum wage because it will hurt all small businesses, it will hurt farm workers, it will hurt employers. Um, what about the people who are working? We pay, we pay a lot of respect to these people. We, last summer, we were talking about, we were praising bus drivers and uh, grocery store clerks and people who stock the shelves and all of these people as being critical employees, work farm workers as well. Uh, well, why don't we pay them like they're critical? We just don't do it. And you know, I, I raise one more anecdote. I'm, I don't have questions for the, the witnesses, but uh, back in 2008, my brother's in the barbecue restaurant business. And he had always voted, we were talking about the minimum wage, and he had always voted Republican because he didn't want to pay as much tax. And he said to me, call me the summer of 2008 and said, John, you'll be, uh, you'll be happy to note that Judy is like, Judy and I are maxing out to Barack Obama and we're voting for all Democrats this year. And I said, that's great, Bob. What was your epiphany? He said, well, I finally figured out that if nobody can afford barbecue, it doesn't matter what my tax rate is. And that's the problem we have right now. Not enough people can afford barbecue. Not enough people make enough money to have a decent standard of living. And this Congress can and should be the Congress that finally takes a step in that direction and says, we're gonna make sure that every American who's working hard has a decent standard of living. That's what the, all these proposals are about. And, and I strongly support them. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Working hard is not enough if you don't make enough. I want to recognize the young lady from Michigan now, Ms. Stevens. Thank you, you Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you for having this hearing and to our phenomenal witnesses, Ms. Romero, Ms. Gilkmoon, and Ms. Dixon, and uh, you know, for your just incredible background and expertise and knowledge. Particular thanks to our chair for going to the history and looking at the root of some of these causes and how they impact us today. Mr. DeCamp, whatever it is you do, uh, you know, it's, I guess it's, you know, we're hearing your viewpoint, although it, it doesn't seem to be importing into the reality that so many of our workers are facing. I, I'm in Michigan and I see it and we feel it. We talk about our tip workers, our food service workers, the people behind the scenes, the lunch ladies who get forgotten, you know, who have been a major part of what we've been living through with this pandemic. You know, the first people to step up in the middle of the shutdown and making sure our folks, our families had access to prepared meals while all of a sudden everything was shouldered at home, you know, making sure they're getting their hero pay and their due and you know they're squeezed. So I'd love to hear from Miss Dixon on, you know, some of these other forgotten workers in our economy, particularly, you know, what is dubbed the lunch lady, but also, you know, our, in our food service. and dovetailing off of what Miss Omar was talking about with our Raise the Wage. You know, I'm a proud co-sponsor of the Raise the Wage Act. And, you know, that's going to phase out the tip wage. And I'm hearing from some forms of constituents um, who hold tip wage, that tip wage jobs, that they're concerned about their take-home pay. And they're concerned it would go down. So, Miss Dixon, do you also mind um, just kind of sharing some comments about what you'd say to those workers as well, based on some of what we've heard, heard here today. Sure, so one of the things to talk about is who's gonna benefit from the Raise the Wage Act. 
And in fact, 90% of the workers who are earning at or near the minimum wage are over the age of 20. And the majority of these workers are adult women, many of whom have attended college and who have children. So more than half, 51%, would benefit our adults ages 25 to 54, and only one in 10 is a teenager. So nearly six in 10 are women, half work full time, and more than four in 10 have some college experience. More than a quarter have children. And then to your other question, uh, could you repeat the other question, please? I just wanted some comments about, you know, other, we're we've got a lot of segments here, brilliant, brilliant comments are on our domestic workers, our farm workers, obviously you, you have a big swath with your portfolio and your organization. And I was just looking for some um, additional feedback around our cafeteria workers, our other food service workers who, you know, not aren't part of the tip wage, but also have been subject to this, some of these draconian principles that have, have held these workers back because they're stuck at an unfair wage, be it the minimum wage where they're not even able to work full time. And if you had any data around, you know, just our other, not just our tip workers in food service, but our, you know, behind the scenes in our schools with our cafeterias or anything along those lines. Um, I don't have anything very specific about them. What I will say is that they are part of the way in which our, our labor market is segregated, right? And certain workers are uh, shunted into low paying jobs that are not uh, that are not compensated at the rate that they should be. So they're underpaid. And we need to, to help those workers in the same way that we're helping tipped workers. So the one fair wage um, would most likely apply to these women uh, that you were talking about in the cafeteria. And then one other thing you had mentioned was um, around what's going to happen to their tips. Are their tips going to go down? And I would point out that data from the one fair wage states demonstrates that tipped workers earn better wages and make the same or better tips in states that allow them to be paid above the subminimum wage. So this custom of tipping, it's deeply ingrained in our culture and people are happy to continue to do that, to have generous tipping for good service. And polling indicates that time and time again, customers are also happy to pay higher prices in order to ensure that workers get vastly better wages. So, and while I still have you, Ms. Dixon, what does history, and this is a big question, so maybe we can just do it for the record about, you know, what does the history of these, you know, racist FLSA ex exclusions teach us about the link between workers' rights and power at the ballot box? And I know, Chair, I'm at 10 seconds left, so <laughs> maybe we can pick that one up, but is there a linkage? There, there absolutely is a linkage just because you have constitutional right or law says you do. We know from history you don't, and it can be intimidation or voter suppression. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. I see uh, Jones is with us, so I'm going to recognize the gentleman from New York. Mr. Jones, you have five minutes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all of the witnesses for your testimony. Uh, it is so important that we shine a light on this issue because it provides yet another example of how the legacy of Jim Crow continues to harm people of color in this country. The history of the Fair Labor Standards Act is well documented. And as we've heard here today, the exclusion of farm workers, domestic workers, and tip workers in the law was done intentionally to exclude black workers from the basic pay and worker protections afforded to white workers under this landmark legislation. There is no good reason why, nearly a century later, we continue to have these exclusions in the law. Congress's failure to act upholds a system of, that oppresses working class people of color, and especially women of color, by the way. That is, in fact, what Congress in 1938 intended. Now, my grandmother was a domestic worker who spent long hours cleaning homes, and she worked well past the age of retirement because she simply could not afford to retire when most people do. Ms. Yoon, you mentioned in your testimony that domestic work was often seen as not real work. How did that perception prevent the fair and full protection of domestic workers under the Fair Labor Standards Act? And do we still hear echoes of this argument today in the debate over extending wage and hour protections to domestic workers? Thank you for your question and thanks for sharing your own story. I think as I've talked about in my testimony, the longstanding association of domestic work as unpaid labor, as women's labor, as labor of black women, 
harping back to the days of slavery and labor of other women of color and immigrant women, I think all contribute to devaluing this labor as unskilled and therefore deemed not worthy of protection and industry standards. I think all the parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents on this committee and my fellow panelists will know that the skills that are needed to raise a child to thrive, skills that are needed to care for your young aging parent who may have dementia to live with dignity or to care for a kid with complex medical condition so that that kid could sleep in her own bed, right? All of this takes incredible amount of skill but we continue to devalue this work. We devalued it back then in 1938, and I think we continue to devalue today. I think the most recent debate about whether care is an infrastructure in our economy as we talk about how we recover our country really speaks to this issue. Our caregiving infrastructure collapsed during the pandemic. 800,000 left the workforce last September alone and we're back to 1988 levels of women workforce participation. Yet some say, largely men, saying it's not infrastructure because it's not roads and bridges, even though this investment in the care and infrastructure will precisely allow not just women, but all parents to go back to work and that will continue to fuel our economy back. Thank you so much, Ms. Yoon, and of course, uh, a few days ago, I introduced the Universal Child Care and Early Learning Act with Senator Elizabeth Warren, which would uh, fully provide for universal child care in this country, child care indeed being infrastructure. Uh, and I could tell you, you know, my, what my grandmother did was real work. I know that because I was with her oftentimes when daycare was too expensive. She had to take me to clean homes with her. Now, Ms. Ms. Dixon, uh, Mr. DeCamp's testimony seems to question whether the exclusion of farm workers and domestic workers in New Deal legislation and in the Fair Labor Standards Act is rooted in racism. He, he talks about there being the a, an absence of compelling evidence in his written testimony. Uh, what compelling evidence do we have on this? And why is denying the roots of these exclusions so harmful? Well, my grandmother used to say, when you know better, do better. And we know better. And we have all of this evidence that tells us that these exclusions are harmful, they are unnecessary, and we need to move on from here. And so I, I think um, the main thing to understand here is that this argument is rooted in the Commerce Clause, right? To say that in the Commerce Clause, uh, there was no authority to actually put these folks in the Fair Labor Standards Act, but this argument is a red herring, herring because there, the constitutional justification issue was raised by one senator during a legislative debate over the bill. And that's suspect on its face. The, the Supreme Court had already changed the interpretation of the Commerce Act by the time the FLSA was passed. So we know that that is just overblown and um, not accurate. Okay, thank you, gentlemen's out of time. Uh, are there any members uh, on the platform who have not been recognized who would like to speak, who have uh, questions? Okay. Well, I want to thank all of the witnesses. I want to remind my colleagues that uh, pursuant to committee practice, materials for submission to the hearing record must be submitted to the clerk within 14 days following the last day of the hearing. So by the close of business on May 17th, preferably in Microsoft Word format. The committee, the material submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing and only a member of the subcommittee or an invited witness may submit materials for inclusion in the hearing record. Documents are limited to 50 pages each. No longer than, uh, documents longer than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record via an internet link that you must provide to the committee clerk within the required time frame, but please recognize that in the future, that link may no longer work. Uh, pursuant to House rules and regulations, items for the record should be submitted to the clerk electronically by emailing submissions to uh, ed and labor DOC hearings at mail.house.gov. Uh, again, I want to thank the witnesses for their participation today. Members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for you. And we ask the witnesses to please respond to those questions in writing. The hearing record will be held open for 14 days in order to receive those responses. 
I remind my colleagues as well that pursuant to committee practice, witness questions for the hearing record must be submitted to the majority committee staff or committee clerk within seven days. The question submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. I want to now recognize the distinguished ranking member for a closing statement. Uh, you're recognized, Mr. Keller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this hearing highlights the need to provide flexibility to the American workforce. Uh, continually, uh, we hear from farmers those in the restaurant industry, small business operators, and others in Pennsylvania's 12th Congressional District about their challenges of recruiting and retaining employees during our economic recovery from COVID-19. We need to be giving employers the tools they need to bring back the American workforce, not creating unworkable mandates that will slow economic recovery. Employers understand the unique challenges facing their businesses, as well as the needs of their employees and work very hard to effectively tailor their workforce practices accordingly. I look forward to advancing forward-looking policy solutions that provide economic freedom and opportunity for employers and employees in the workplace and help them bring their businesses back stronger than ever. Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record letters from the American Farm Bureau Federation and the National Restaurant Association statements from the Restaurant Workers of America, and a letter from Valerie J. Graham, who is a tipped worker in Washington, D.C., in opposition to the legislation we are discussing here today. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, so ordered. Uh, I now recognize myself for the purpose of making my closing statement. I want to thank our expert witnesses for being with us today and uh, reiterate how grateful I am for the diverse perspectives and expertise that you brought to our discussion. We cannot build a more equitable future for this country without first confronting the active legacy of slavery throughout our institutions and recognizing the federal government's continued role in perpetuating racial discrimination. This is precisely what we did today. We recognized the significant influence racist lawmakers and Jim Crow era policies played in inserting racially motivated exclusions into our nation's foundational labor laws. We examined how expansions for worker protections under the Fair Labor, Labor Standards Act have since helped narrow the racial wage gap, as well as how persistent exclusions continue uh, to disadvantage workers of color today. Most importantly, however, we affirmed our commitment to passing legislation that will finally eliminate these discriminatory exclusions in the FLSA and extend basic worker protections to farm workers, domestic workers, and tip workers. So thank you all again to our witnesses. I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues to confront the legacies of, of slavery and secure equal worker protections for workers of color and forge an economy where everyone can succeed. I continue to say that working hard is not enough if you don't make enough. And so if there's no further business without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned.